22nd of August 1998, I was arrested and brought to the CID and uh, kept there for 14 days and then uh, produced in court and uh, I was given a 45 years uh, prison term. One of the sentences was uh, supposed to run concurrent with the rest of the two sentences, so I got 30 years. But in 1998, it was different. Going to a prison as a teenager, it was a playful playground for me. This time, everything was being taken away. Whatever I have uh, built around me was crumbling. There's nobody else in that prison who will understand me because they all had their own problems. Even the officers, officers, they have their own work to do. They have their own problems to settle. So my mind automatically turned to the Lord. He was the only person I could talk to. There's nobody else in that prison who will understand me. There was only one person who could do that, and he was Jesus. I'm James, James Radhakrishna Yanasegaran. I was born in Singapore, raised up in Singapore, and I'm still living in Singapore. About 25 years ago, I was uh, incarcerated. Four years ago, I was released. I come from uh, an orthodox uh, Hindu family. When my parents came to Singapore from Nagapatnam, which is in uh, India, South India, they came to Singapore and uh, started jewelry business in uh, Tanjong Paga. During the 60s, uh, uh, there was uh, some uh, racial problems in Singapore between two races, major races, and my father was afraid for our safety and uh, he brought us all to India. And for about uh, two and a half years, uh, I was staying in India. And at the age of seven and a half, that is halfway through uh, uh, school time, I came back to Singapore and uh, started school again. My parents were a very religious minded people. I was getting more and more into religious beliefs, that is Hinduism. I even uh, signed up for Krishna, our guide, and uh, all other uh, religious movements at that time in the 70s when I was in uh, primary school. And slowly when I stepped into uh, secondary schools, a little bit of uh, things changed. It was a very nice school, peaceful school, and no rowdyism and all this. So I became the rowdy of that school. And that was the place where it all started. So with uh, a family full of uh, good people, so-called good people, I was the black sheep of that family. From a very young time, uh, my mind was in the streets. Because in the, in the 70s, Srangoon Road was not a good place for a child to be brought up, especially an Indian child to be brought up. I mean, uh, when you step into the street, it's all there. You see, gangsterism, drugs, drinks, gambling, everything you can uh, find in the streets. So I got slowly, uh, step by step, into that life. And I thought that was a very glittery and uh, glamorous life, and I stuck to that. I was already in the gang. Uh, I did a lot of muscle for higher things. And I have beaten up a few people in uh, Srangoon Road and I was arrested along with my friends, six of them. And I didn't know that uh, I was going to be arrested, so I went to the army. About three months into the army, they came to the camp and uh, arrested me. And I got uh, nine months and six strokes of the cane. That was my first stint in prison. 
And after the release, I continued army upon uh, completion. With my mother insisting that I should get married and settle down and all this, I got married at an early age. And uh, later on, I uh, had uh, four kids. First one, a girl and uh, three other boys. Uh, I was working in the ship, ship repairs and uh, all, all this uh, kind of stuff. Not in the shipyard, but uh, off, offshore work. A lot of uh, offshore work for a company called Western Eagle. So my, at that time, my life was uh, going on uh, smoothly for a couple of years. And uh, I got arrested again in 1982. And this case was not a fresh one, but a continuation of the earlier part of my life before the first incarceration. It was one of the problems I left behind and it followed me to the, that year. In 1982, I was in, uh, sent to prison again, another nine months. This time no uh, strokes and stuff. It's just a three to three common assault. So during that second uh, prison term, towards the end of the prison term, about 18 days before release, my family members came and told me that uh, my mother had uh, passed away. And uh, they were about to ask for a temporary release, a day's release, for me to go and uh, perform some uh, last rites. But I did not want to go. Because during her stay in this world, I did not give her a peaceful life. It was always worrying about me. And I didn't want to shame her even in her last uh, few I was in this earth. So I told them that I'm not coming. Let them uh, do everything by themselves. In the earlier uh, days of my life, when I was even uh, about nine, 10 years, I used to uh, hang around with my father at the jewelry shop. And I was asked to, you know, go to places to purchase gold, Sometimes uh, quite a, a large amount of money I'll be carrying. So I was uh, robbed once by a couple of uh, Chinese boys. And I told myself this will never happen again. So I had to be in that system to fight them. So I had to go into the streets to the, to the gangs, the local boys, because there are a lot of other uh, jewelry shops. They were all facing this kind of same problems because they were targeted. It started as a small group to uh, self-defend. I mean, it's a self-defense group among friends. And slowly, when we went into the uh, teenage, it changed. We went into triad societies. Triad societies, uh, it all started from, uh, uh, I think, uh, mainland China. They had to fight against uh, foreign powers. So they came up with these uh, boxer movements and all this. And the triad societies uh, formed. And one of the uh, main countries were Hong Kong to practice this. Then from there, it spread to Malaysia and Singapore. And I was uh, in, the, uh, in the main controlling power in, in and around uh, uh, Serangoon Road, which is now called uh, Little India. And I had my own uh, small section and a group of uh, boys under me. Of course, I think it is all wrong now, but uh, at that time it was a uh, very glamorous life, walking uh, a few guys around you and uh, you know that uh, you are invincible at that time and all this. So I went deeper and deeper and deeper until, you know, there was no way out and things all got worse and worse day by day. At that time, I realized that uh, people were starting to despise me. Not respect, but fear. Until 1996, I was incarcerated again. So during that time, I was uh, losing faith in the uh, Hindu religion already. For a very short period, I lived as an atheist, just wanted to live my life by myself. At the age of uh, 16, I was uh, starting to smoke marijuana and drinking. So even after my incarceration, the second uh, prison term, I came out and I continued doing 
a little bit of drugs and all this. And slowly uh, it became a habit also and became an addiction later. And by 1998, I was already far, far deep into that already. By that time, I was already a wasted person. My mind was uh, too corrupted and too, like a, a very hardcore person already doing anything, just about anything, not for money, not for uh, anything, just, just, just that I can do it, that's all. I had become a, a evil person. Not born an evil person, but uh, slowly transformed into a, an evil person by then. I did not uh, concentrate on their lives. Madam Indrani, that is my wife. We got married at a very early age. She was a very loving wife to me at that time. But I did not do the right things uh, a husband should have done for her, taking care of her, taking care of the family and the children together with her. And when I was in uh, prison also, she, she was there alone to take care of the children. And she brought them up nicely into big, respectable children. 22nd of August, 1998, I was arrested and brought to the CID and uh, kept there for 14 days and then uh, produced in court and uh, I was given a 45 years uh, prison term. And uh, one of the sentences was uh, supposed to run concurrent with the rest of the two uh, sentences. So I got 30 years. But this time it was different. Going to a prison as a teenager, it was a playful place, a playground for me. You know, it was just raring to fight and, uh, you know, establishing your territory. That was the main aim from morning till evening when you're in the general population. You want to do that. That's all. This time, in 1998, everything was being taken away. Whatever I have uh, built around me was crumbling, all falling away. The first six years of that uh, prison life was a very turbulent one. Uh, the old Changi prison was a very crowded place where you spend uh, uh, the whole day uh, in a room with uh, three, four guys in the same room, a small room, small cell. But even with those uh, three, four guys in the same room, you will feel very lonely. And that is when many of us turn to the Lord. After my remand period of eight and a half months, I was transferred to Changi prison. I was having fights, arguments, even towards uh, officers. I was very rude. I don't know what kind of life I was living in that uh, first six years. I went to segregation six times. Every time a segregation uh, period will be three months where you will be locked up and uh, you will only leave your cell to have your shower and that's it. And you don't go to the yard for exercise or anything. So after three months, you will come back to the general population. So this way, I went about six uh, segregation periods. Each time I come back to the general population, I'll be around for a month, two weeks, a month, one and a half months, then I'll go back to segregation. And one of the reasons I got a divorce because uh, I did not want my children to be visiting me in prison every, every now and then. Because someone is going to see them outside prison and ask them, why are you here? I'm here to visit my father. But I didn't want that to happen to my children. I want that shame, stigma all to be with me. And that's it. So I separated my from my wife and stop the children from coming to the prison. The other reason is that for the past 20 years, I have been away from the families, so I have slowly faded away from their life. Suddenly, I go back to my family and uh, I am present in their family photos and functions 
some questions will be asked. Where was he all this time? And I didn't want to that, want that to happen also. When I got to know my wife, she was a teenager when I knew her, uh, and then later got married to her. The first date I had her had with her was in an old folks' home. It's a Ten Saint Teresa's home in uh, Thompson Road. She asked me to come to Blessed uh, Sacrament Church, and I thought, okay, this is it. Okay, I have a, I can have a day with my, uh, you know, girlfriend. And suddenly a bus came and picked us up and went to the old folks' home. She was already involved in these Catholic movements at that time. Blessed Sacrament Church in uh, Queenstown. From there, maybe uh, I got closer to the church. From time to time, I have uh, attended a Mass in that uh, church, but I was not a baptized Catholic, so I didn't uh, receive communion. Or even my children also, we don't receive communion, but we attend Mass and we listen to Mass and all this. End of 99, one of the ASPs, Assistant Superintendent of uh, Prisons, Mr. Sami, Victor Sami, he is a Catholic. And he asked me, in your registry, you have erased the Hindu and uh, wrote as Catholic. Are you a baptized Catholic? I said, no, but I am a follower of the Catholic faith. And he said, okay, in that case, uh, why don't you start attending our counseling sessions and, uh, you know, I can uh, provide you with Bible and books and stuff. You can do that. I said, okay. And from there, we developed this great friendship, which is lasting until today. He brought the Lord to us every week and I was going deeper and deeper into that faith. And that is when I told myself I had to step out of this stupid circle. Year 2003, I finished my last uh, segregation and I came down to the general population and I met Brother Jimmy in that place, in uh, A Hall. And from there, we have uh, developed this great friendship, which is lasting until today. And I signed up for Roman Catholic Prison Ministry Counseling Sessions. And in 2007, I was baptized. In 2006, we had a Christmas celebration in one of the multi-purpose rooms in uh, cluster A1. As always, I used to prepare the room for the counselings. There was a lady in white. She came and sat next to me. That is none other than Sister Enrica, the angel who touched my life, who changed my life. She was sitting there and asking me questions about myself and my family and uh, each and every word she was speaking, uh, I mean, like, uh, it was, I mean, very kind, very sweet, kind words, but it was something like a burning arrow, you know, poking into me. I didn't deserve this person's love at all. I didn't deserve this person's merciful words at all. I was a very evil person. All of a sudden, I didn't know why I started crying. So I told my friend, uh, you know, what is happening to me? I, I don't feel good. I want to go back to the cell. I, I want to be alone. Then he said, never mind. You just sit down here. Just go through this thing. Let it happen. I went to the open yard. I met my so-called general headman. I told him, I cannot serve two masters anymore. I don't want to have any affiliations with any of the gangs anymore. I wanted to be out. He just looked at me. He said, are you sure? Yeah. Okay, go. Serve the Lord. So I left the gangs. From that day, I was no, no more a gang member. I came back to the cell, cleaned up the cell. No more magazines, no more anything. No offensive things in my cell. I cleared everything. And I told myself, I'll be baptized. And the following week, I told my counselor and I told Brother Jimmy that I want to be baptized. And they gave me a crash course 
RCIA course. From that week, we started the RCIA course and uh, I completed that RCIA course. That day changed everything in my life. I told Brother Jimmy about my desire to be a prison counselor. He said, okay, praise the Lord. We will pray and work towards that. And from that time, we were working on it. Silently, of course, without much, uh, much uh, ado, we went through the process. He was uh, teaching me how things were done uh, in the prison. And at one point, I was uh, even uh, guiding the seminarians from this place who were attached to our prison ministry who came there for service, Saturday and Sunday service. Sister Enrica will uh, tell them, never mind, you go up, the boy will guide you. And they come up and look for a boy and I was the boy, the bald-headed boy who was uh, there to guide them. So from there, I learned how to do things independently also uh, as, a, as a counselor, what should be done. But of course, I was on the other side. Towards my release, nearer, nearer, coming nearer to my release, even uh, during all my interviews, I was telling them the same thing in the, in the prison, the prison officers. I told them the same thing. I wanted to be a counsellor. I told them that I'll come back to prison and they got a shock. What? Why do you want to come back to a prison? I want to be a counsellor. Oh, I see. Okay, never mind. When you come back, my superintendent at that time, Mr. C, who is the uh, assistant director now, told me that if your application comes to me, to my table, I'll be the first one to sign. So, okay. So from then I was uh, given more and more confidence to contribute to this uh, RCPM. And I was released on a Saturday. I was placed in a halfway house because I had to have a place to stay. And as that, and uh, as the halfway house, as an anchor point, I can work on other things. My work, my other things, I can apply for a accommodation and all these things. I had a place to, I need a place to start all these things. I came out in a, on a Saturday and uh, the next morning, Sunday morning, I was in Risen Christ, sitting next to Brother Jimmy attending Mass. Because I know that uh, Brother Jimmy will be attending every Sunday. He already told me that uh, I'll be at uh, Risen Christ. You come there and see me. So the next morning, very next morning, I was there. And the following Monday, the next Monday, the next day, I was with him in the Rosary Prayer uh, in the same church at uh, 7.30 in the evening. So this journey outside of prison continued with Brother Jimmy. He's my brother, he's my mentor, he's my friend. Next to Jesus, he is for me always. And I'm taking up more and more activities in the church. Every Monday now, I'm uh, helping out in the church office, manning the church office in the evenings. And Wednesdays days, we'll be attending uh, RCPM meetings in a uh, Good Shepherd Convent with uh, Sister Gerard. Sundays, I'll be in church for warden duties. Sunday afternoons, I'll be in the prisons for uh, Catholic uh, counselling sessions. And any other obligation days and festival days, I'll be in the church helping out as wardens, duty and all this. And I'm in the Topsy's security team also in the church. Today I understand He is my Saviour, He saved my life. I was a very bad person, a hard-hearted person, sort of curse to this uh, society. Today I stand here as not as a curse, not as a relic of my past extravagance. Jesus saved my life, not only me, but He changed millions of lives who only had to stop and listen to His teachings. To each and everyone who is watching this program and who knows me, and especially to my family, my wife, my daughter, and my three children, and all my siblings. I know I have uh, caused much hurt, suffering. I have brought a lot of uh, misery into your life. But all I, all I can say is, if I can, if the Lord permits me to travel back in time and change all those things, I will. Even at the cost of my life, I will.
there are days i sincerely say sorry to you in my heart but i know you you can never hear that today i am saying it on screen i'm really very sorry Turn back towards God. Rise up. <laughs>